Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Mark Bamuthi Joseph, who serves as Vice President and Artistic Director of Social Impact at the Kennedy Center. Bamuthi, welcome to the show. Hey, what's up, good brother? Uh, well, it is so, always so, so great to have you on the show. I am you know, very honored to be able to know about so much of the incredible work that you do and leadership you bring to the field. And obviously, Obviously at the Kennedy Center, uh, which is one of our great um, uh, creative partners uh, and help us, of course, co-curate uh, this show. Um, so I figured first kind of just delve in, you know, the past two years have been uh, very intense, to say the least, for many uh, organizations around the country. But, you know, a lot of us, a lot of organizations, you know, look to the Kennedy Center uh, to see how are things going, you know, kind of what's the barometer there um, and are there ways in which we can really kind of follow and take a lead. Um, and so wondering if you could just kind of share with us, how are things uh, at the Kennedy Center? Um, and uh, any kind of key things coming up? And then from that, I'll probably take us a little into kind of some digital aspects and digital space coming out of COVID, things like that. But first and foremost, just generally, how are things? Sure, well, um, things at the Kennedy Center are like things around the country, volatile, um, committed, uh, responsive. And when vision is present uh, and there is strategy, things are, um, things are great. And when we are reactive, uh, there's, a, you know, there's a lot to be, um, that's left to be desired. Um, being the National Cultural Center um, is a fantastic inflection point. It's an amazing kind of perch of accountability. Um, and it's, it's a really positive leverage um, space for those of us that um, curate in traditional artistic disciplines, but also who curate community. Yeah. And I think one of the things that uh, we are um, embodying is this transition from a community engagement um, paradigm, which is what I inherited, um, the and moving from there to a community empowerment paradigm, which um, really separates out, um, in my mind, the kind of DEI framework, which tends to run those three things, diversity, equity, and inclusion, as kind of one conflated idea and um, really thinks a, a little bit more profoundly about equity in historically marginalized communities and using the arts for non-arts outcomes. So that's philosophically what's happening behind the scenes, just um, moving through our programmatic output and our um, public output, a, a, a kind of embedded pedagogy that makes sense across the institution as to not only why we do the things that we do, um, not only who we are choosing to do those things with, but also to upping the ante for ourselves and for the field in terms of um, what it means not just to um, programmatically represent, but to actually invest in historically stigmatized and historically marginalized um, communities and artists. Um, what that has looked like over the course of the last year is um, a, a kind of re-emergence of our millennium stage, which is um, traditionally has been a free program that has um, been uh, put on our stages every day of the year, but scaling back um, to three, four days and um, paying artists more equitably and having 
a kind of curatorial lens that really is um, more demographically focused. Um, it includes the cartography project, which is a pipeline commissioning and equity project that focuses on young composers of color, black composers from eight different cities um, across the United States, um, all doing work in opera and in chamber. Um, orchestral music that focuses on Black dignity. Um, it includes an investment in a group um, we call the Culture Caucus, which essentially is having 22, 23 artists and activists in residence. Um, it means launching the Office Hours Program, which is one of the largest incubation residencies that I think we have um, in the country, where different artists of different mediums all over the country get $10,000 and time and space at the Kennedy Center, not to produce anything, but to just be in process. So really focusing on um, incubation um, as and, and process um, as a, a kind of capital that we want to generate uh, in the arts. Um, this also is our 50th anniversary season, and I guess one of the things that we are looking forward to is bringing together a group of individuals and organizations that we call the Next 50, um, the folks who have um, had the torch passed down to them from Harry Belafonte or Stevie Wonder or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. We've asked ourselves, you know, we've had all these amazing cultural leaders. Um, passed through our doors over the last 50 years, who are the next 50? Um, so honoring them um, in September. So all that's going on just in the realm of social impact. And then of course, there are um, you know, programs every night of the week um, focused on family, focused on orchestra and symphony, focused on theater, on hip hop, and uh, you know, and it, it's a lot cracking. So <laughs> undergirding it with impact <laughs> values is the gig. Yeah, it will. I mean, first of all, just the not just the breadth, but the depth of mm -hmm. the work that you do is just is obviously is truly extraordinary. Um, and I thought I would just dive deep just for a second into kind of the uh, idea that you shared about really evolving from community engagement to community empowerment. Um, and right. you shared a host of things that, that you're doing that are clearly very empowering. And just wondering if you could mm -hmm. share for any you know, of our audience who are looking and saying, oh, well, we've had this community engagement programming we've been doing, a presenter or an orchestra, whoever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, and but we're interested in this. Is there kind of is there an example that you could share of here would be an example of this thing as community engagement, but with community yeah. empowerment, here's what's different. Here is how that would be. So as you think about this work that you're doing, are you just engaging? Are you empowering? Here's a kind of through point to look for, to see. Is there anything you could kind of help us to do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in our field, um, we have struggled for a long time with diversity of audience, let alone diversity of staff and diversity of, um, of leadership. And I think we tend to think of our job in the arts as to present the world's best art and um, present that art to um, a, a multifaceted, multivalent, multi-generational um, population um, inside of our cultural radius that, you know, that we call our audience. Um, when we think of our job in those terms and primarily in those terms, then our primary target is to engage communities that um, haven't historically been counted in our um, roles as audience. And there are any number of reasons why that may be, you know, price might be a barrier, curation might be a barrier, psychological, um, you know, um, obstacles might be a barrier. There, there are any number of, um, of reasons, um, but I think, as an artist who has often traveled um, across the country and done um, community engagement workshops, particularly with, with young populations, one of the things that I found unsatisfying is that, you know, you come into Chicago, you coming in, you come into Topeka, Kansas, or you come into Ann Arbor, or you come into Philadelphia, wherever, wherever it is, and you work with a group of, you know, let's say young people for um, an hour, an hour and a half, and then you go. And um, that relationship dissipates as well. And if we're lucky, um, you know, some of the best of us, you know, in the presenting field, um, use that workshop and say, if anybody wants to come to the show, we have free tickets. So there's an engagement or residency activity, and then we invite kids 
um, or young people, or again, like whatever population to then come to the show. Uh, it's, it's a kind of, it's a way of providing access to the arts. That's engagement. Empowerment is to look at that population in a different way and think about um, that population in terms of their own agency, their own power, um, uh, their, their access to the creation of um, their own enterprise. So um, the Culture Caucus, I think, is a pretty good example where um, we had a highly democratic process um, with our community advisory board, staff members, the office of the president at the, um, at the Kennedy Center, where we asked a wide swath of individuals within our kind of institutional family, um, who are the activists and the artists that we should be investing in? and um, got you know, 250 different responses, which we eventually whittled down to 25. In a lot of cases, these are people that we would have emailed and said, um, we're doing a show that we think might interest your community. Could you help spread the word? That's engagement, right? What we did with this group of individuals is we said, we want you to be in residence over the course of the next three years. We're gonna give you $10,000 a year um, for the next three years, not to do programming at the Kennedy Center, but to do the programming that you're doing in community that you're already doing, whether you work with um, system involved um, youth or um, disabled actors or um, young poets or um, uh, black girls through um, rites of passage. Um, you know, uh, uh, hip hop education, or you're an elder working with the DC music legends. Um, you know, you're, you're Carol Foster working with the International Association of, um, of Blacks and Dance. Wh whatever it is, we're going to invest in you as residents. And we're also going to open up the reach, um, our, um, our, our new campus expansion for you to have process-based activity in the space. That's the difference between engagement and empowerment. We're gonna pay you we're going to give you space, um, and we're also going to give you um, programming uh, leverage um, because the Culture Caucus is going to program the Millennium Stage throughout the summer. That's equity. That's empowerment. That's um, putting dollars down. And you know, we often say that budgets are moral documents. And I think if um, what we want to do beyond building audience is we want to build trust and we wanna build relationship. So asking someone to make an invitation for one show doesn't build trust or relationship. Having somebody in residence for three years is an opportunity to build trust and relationship as well as programming leverage within the ecosystem of the Kennedy Center itself. I absolutely just love that. And I think will uh, be so impactful to so many in our audience and partnering organizations that are looking for that and absolutely want to empower and but are looking and just haven't necessarily maybe gotten there yet from the engagement level uh, to empowerment. Uh, so absolutely, absolutely amazing, amazing work. Um, so I mentioned I early on. Say... Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I just want to say quickly about that, because I think it's really important what you just said. Every individual, every institution, every organization is in a different place. And we're very lucky at the Kennedy Center, not only to be 50 years deep, but to um, be positioned within the national creative ecosystem the way um, that we are. So that level of investment is part of our privilege but it also means that it's part of our responsibility. So start where you start, but hold the vision. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely awesome. And, and just wondering, I had mentioned this early on, but so many organizations coming out of, hopefully in many ways, uh, the pandemic era, um, uh, have really incorporated and plan to moving forward digital. And just wondering if you could kind of speak to that a little and, and what that digital life is looking like and will look like moving forward for the Kennedy Center. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I still think that it's a very, very hard place for all of us because though we are content creators, we are also sorcerers. And what I mean by that is the content that we create has as one of its key elements, the magic of live interaction. 
of um, people being together in a space at the same time, holding energy at the same time. And whatever emotion is created is actually part of the performative experience. That's what makes us different than um, you know, people who make cinema. Um, for instance, or people um, that um, that are really focused on a different kind of um, product. So I, I think that during the pandemic, creating access through digital portals was absolutely vital. It was sustaining um, both for audiences and for, um, for institutions. Um, I think making content for digital consumption requires a different level of partnership. Um, and partnership not only with the content creators, but also with um, streaming platforms so that there's an understanding of um, how it is that we make work, why it is that we make work and being very clear about what what the different audiences are that are consuming this work. So with the Kennedy Center, we have a partnership with PBS um, that enables us to broadcast the Mark Twain Prize. And um, soon on the horizon, there are going to be um, a number of performances from the Kennedy Center that um, live at PBS. Um, probably the most iconic product that comes out of the Kennedy Center is the Kennedy Center Honors, which for several years has been broadcast um, on CBS um, in December and early January. Um, when we did our cartography project, we worked with um, a filmmaker, Howard alum named T.L. Benton and his production company, Mecca Filmworks. Um, and we, we worked with them to create a 10-part docuseries about cartography. I think that's one of the um, directions that we're going to continue moving in, is um, thinking about extended narrative storytelling. Um, so beyond the kind of conveying of um, a public performance and documenting it, you know, kind of as such, telling the story of that performance and partnering with um, really talented filmmakers, particularly talented BIPOC filmmakers to tell those stories is going to be a large part of the Kennedy Center future. Yeah. We have a program called the Arts Across America as well, um, where there are performances in the Everglades and Baltimore and um, in Minneapolis and um, um, among First Nations peoples in, uh, in South Dakota, where we go to different spaces around the country and again, tell the story on the ground of the creative output that's happening on the ground in these spaces. Uh, again, the telling of the story, the codifying of the story and creating docu-series based on that work is going to be um, a key component, I think, of our future strategy. Absolutely awesome. Absolutely awesome. So unfortunately, we're just about out of time, but mm -hmm. all of this extraordinary leadership that you are bringing uh, comes, has to come with challenges and tough days <laughs> or when things feel overwhelming. And yeah. for all of us, you know, we always try and capture on the show administrative leaders. Um, mm -hmm. On those toughest days, what do you draw on as a leader to move forward, to overcome, to, you know, get through what sometimes seems like the toughest of times? I, you know, I am reading um, Bell Hooks, um, all, all About Love, and she references an author named Peck in Defining Love, where she categorizes it, where they categorize love as being both um, the intent and the will to um, contribute to the spiritual and emotional growth of others. I love all the components of that. Um, intention, attention, spiritual growth, emotional health, and a focus on the other. And I think when things get really hard, that's where I try to go back to is love. Maybe I spent you know too much time in California and um, love as a default doesn't feel practical, but it's another thing that she talks about, which is the, um, the idea that the heart is the seat of learning. 
not just the mind. Um, and so when things get tough, that's where I retreat to, the heart as the seat of my experience. Now, um, it, it helps that I work with a profound staff at the Kennedy Center, that my team in social impact in particular um, um, is lovely, is dynamic, gets the vision, um, that my colleagues on the curatorial team from uh, Simone Eccleston, our um, director of hip hop culture and contemporary um, music to Jane Rabinovitz, our director of dance to um, Alicia Adams, our vice president of international programming. Like there are really fantastic curators um, in the midst. And when things get administratively hard, I can live inside of their programming for some kind of relief and some kind of um, remembrance. Um, and then maybe the third thing that I think of is our ancestors um, who um, worked probably a lot harder under much more strenuous conditions and didn't work so hard for me to give up because I hate spreadsheets. <laughs> or for me to give up because my budget number isn't what I want it to be. Um, this work is bigger than us. So um, love, inspiration, and ancestry, those things get me through. Mark Bamuthi Joseph, you truly are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our world. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me. Oh, there is something that I want to share. Hey, all right. All right. Zach, I totally forgot. So um, I am partnering with Rika Eno to um, host a two-day workshop called Healing Forward. And so, Aaron, I would just say to you and to anybody that's watching this, if uh, you were at all interested in any of the philosophies behind what we've talked about, uh, come join us the weekend before Juneteenth on the 16th and 17th. There's a lot more uh, that we can do in terms of strategizing together. Absolutely awesome. Thanks again so much. And definitely you, everyone, sir. please do check it out. Thanks again so much. Thank you, fam. Be safe.